Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining AWS Workshops from Home webinar sessions. AWS Workshop from Home are a series of short webinars we're organizing for you and provided by AWS Educate. These are designed for students and educators around the world who are passionate about cloud and technology and who want to continue learning and practicing during this period of time. We plan for a series of short technical topics around AWS core services for everyone so that you can start learning and experimenting with cloud technology and create web apps and solutions in cloud environment today. For this series of webinars, we had prepared a variety of topics for you. Later on in the coming weeks, we will be covering AWS core cloud services such as Elastic Cloud Compute, Virtual Private Cloud, and more advanced topics such as AWS serverless. These sessions are designed for learners at different levels. So please take a look at our list of topics prepared for you and choose the ones that are right for you. In these series of webinars, you will be following our lecturers who are AWS solution architects and technical managers to learn about each specific topics. For AWS Educate members, you will also have access to labs through AWS Educate to practice right after the lecturing. In your spare time, please get back to AWS Educate to enjoy the rich environment and content that we're providing on the platform for you to continue learning and practicing. AWS Educate is provided at no cost to all students and educators. We will also be opening the forum for a question and answer and try to address as many questions as we can during each webinar. In the end of the session, you'll be asked several questions on the next topics that you are interested to hear. And that will help us to focus on providing the topics that are mostly relevant to you and in the highest demand. So please do take a moment to answer those survey questions after you exit the webinar. Without further ado, let me introduce our main speakers today, Mr. Andrew and Zoran. Andrew Hodges is the solution architect at AWS and Zoran is the technical program manager for AWS Educate program. Andrew, over to you. Welcome to another uh, AWS workshop from home. And what we're actually going to talk to today is Introduction to the AWS Infrastructure as a Code and IAC Cloud Formation Models. Uh, welcome, I'm Andrew Hodges, and I'm just going to run you through this particular section. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll actually move through a little bit further in uh, some other uh, content area. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, infrastructure, uh, how we look at uh, manual versus automation, how we actually look at doing AWS cloud formation uh, and what that actually means. Then after that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Zoran, who is here, and he's going to talk a little bit more about AWS Educate, <coughs> pardon me, and also creating a cloud formation stack. He's actually going to move through some of the examples that we've got uh, there and um, also show you both cloud formation and Elastic Beanstalk. So why are we doing this? Well, one of the challenges that we've got when we're actually running the infrastructure, and bear in mind that you would have, I believe, already covered some of the contents around how we actually put together the AWS uh, infrastructure environment, how you model with things like EC2 instances, how you actually create your own um, infrastructure that's uh, that's actually got um, uh, many, many applications. Um, but you've been building this model for uh, quite some time in an on-premise environment, and some of the rules have typically applied in how you actually put the infrastructure together. AWS has more than 175 different services now. And as you have seen in the last program, uh, you can start that process of building applications in the AWS environment by allocating some of the resources, infrastructure in your own virtual cloud environment. <clears throat> Build the networking, specify the type of storage you need, the compute resources, the databases, etc. And if you think about this, it can be quite complex, especially with 175 applications. 
uh, or services. If you're connecting to your on-premise environment, you'll need to also ensure that your IP address ranges don't clash, that the security groups and permissions reflect how you want your organisation to connect, what routing tables need to be created, what sized instances you're going to need for running your applications, or if you are building infrastructure using EC2 instances, the way you may have done it in the past in an on-premise environment with servers to select the servers that they, uh, the, with the highest sizing that you've actually needing to, uh, to run. In AWS, we talk a lot about horizontal scaling. There's no real requirement to specify large amounts of servers for only dealing with the small workloads that might be running at a particular point in time. So being able to scale up and down actually saves quite an amount of money. With AWS, you can fire up additional services when and as when you need them and reduce the number of servers that you might have using a concept called auto-scaling. Some of you may have already heard of that already. You can shut down those servers when the workload is actually reduced. So why run a website that will handle you know, thousands, of, uh, thousands of users uh, when only one or two might be uh, sort of connecting at uh, midnight or whatever? So the workloads... Um, also, when you're looking at building applications, you might want to also consider how you're actually running the infrastructure. So we're not just talking about servers now. We're talking about perhaps Docker containers um, or Kubernetes container services. How do you actually manage those? How do you actually build infrastructure to suit that? And then if you've gone one step further and you want to look at uh, building things uh, using serverless architectures, perhaps it's uh, Lambda, you know, taking... Um, uh, doing process automation, um, then there are also needs to be able to integrate those tool sets and to be able to use them when you uh, need to run those services. There's always a risk of, of doing manual processes. I've talked a little bit about the challenges of building an architecture. Take that into account and consider what you would have been trying to do with manual processes. It would not be easy to scale. Scaling is an automated process that can create servers in minutes. Can you imagine how long it would take to build new images, update the images with new applications, or perhaps create a new gold image? How difficult is it to do version control on these new servers? How do you manage the security of these servers? Manage patching. How do you do auditing, ensuring that you're meeting the compliance? And then... <clears throat> Is there a risk in getting the data inconsistent? How do we manage where we're storing the information, manage the data, the log files across the large array of platform services? There's always a challenge in manual services. And as such, and as much as we try, we are humans and we do make mistakes. So automation reduces that risk. There's always a challenge. Our production environment will need patches. Software updates, both at a operating system level and all an application level. And some of the applications you run may not work in the newer uh, operating system uh, patched environments. So you need to be able to test these out. What happens if the OS changes? There's always a risk. Some of you may recall in the past, scheduled updates had occurred and when the users were not accessing the environment, to fix this, we created a dev, test and UAT separate from a production environment so that some of the risks could be tested first before launching that production environment. Then there are issues about the security world of dealing with those zero-day attacks from the people who work hard to break our systems. There are often more creative ways of deploying new patching uh, or patched AMIs. Think about how you might do it with auto-scaling. Changing the AMI before it actually gets fired up and then shutting down the old servers which, uh, which might be running and replacing them automatically using auto-scaling to recover from those uh, instances that have been shut down. That's a way of dealing with some of the patching uh, arrangements and still using the auto-scaling as a means of dealing with um, the structural change. Well, I think um, I've given you some areas to think about. There are also needs for configuration management. Upgrading instances with new instance types, I've talked a little bit about that, maybe because of hardening instances or using new OS uh, support. Maybe we need to replace unhealthy instances in the examples in our previous slide. 
you might uh, achieve this, as I've discussed, through auto-scaling. What is your disaster recovery scheme? Do you create cold instances or use smaller instances with pilot light models or a fully operational and probably more expensive highly parallel available uh, availability models. Autoscaling, I've talked about this for EC2 instances, but what about containers? What do we do when we manage this? If you are looking for serverless environments, how do you create that mix? Well, we have a number of technologies that, uh, that are available for configuring our instances and automating this process. So we're moving away from just looking at uh, manually uh, monitoring or managing this to automating the process. There are a range of considerations uh, to be made when building your infrastructure. Dealing with user data. I'm not just talking about who has access or credentials that you don't want to put in instances and have them at risk, or applications. But how can you run instances with the right privileges so that the work environment uh, that you want to run is running? It's not surprising that you will have a substantial number of AMIs which will change. Maybe change because of your OS, because of performance. Maybe you want to look at running applications on different chipsets. Maybe it's on Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, ARM processors, or maybe you're even looking at the Nitro hypervisors. How do you take into account the best practices? AWS created a well-architected, uh, based on best practice examples of how we deploy our infrastructure. These models are listed in real-life examples that you can use. So then you have choice. You can use OpsWorks. OpsWorks is a configuration management service that provides managed instances of Chef and Puppet. Chef and Puppet are automated platforms that allow you to code, autom code use code to automate and configure your servers. OpsWorks lets you use Chef and Puppet to automate how servers are configured, deployed, and managed across your EC2 instances or on-premise compute environments. OpsWorks has three offerings. AWS OpsWorks for Chef Automate, AWS OpsWorks for Puppet Enterprise, and AWS OpsWorks for Slack, Stacks. Sorry. AWS Beanstalk is another tool. AWS Elastic Beanstalk is an easy-to-use service for deploying and scaling web applications and, in, and service developed with Java, .NET, PHP, Node.js, Python, Ruby, Go, and Docker on familiar servers such a, uh, as Apache, Nginx, Passenger, and IIS. You can simply upload your, K, uh, your code and Elastic Beanstalk will automatically handle the deployment from capacity provisioning, load balancing, auto-scaling, to application health monitoring. At the same time, you retain full control over the AWS resources powering your applications and can access the underlying resources at any time. There is no additional charge for Elastic Beanstalk. You can pay for the AWS resources you need to store and run your applications. And then we're going into a little bit more detail with AWS CloudFormation. AWS CloudFormation provides, um, allows you to use programming languages or a simple text file to model and provision in an automated and secure manner all of the resources needed for your application across all regions and accounts. This gives you a single source of your truth. AWS CloudFormation uh, gives you an ability to model it all. AWS CloudFormation allows you to model your entire infrastructure and application resources with either a text file or programming languages. The AWS CloudFormation registry and CLI makes it easy to manage third-party resources with CloudFormation. This provisions a single source of truth for all your resources and helps you to standardize infrastructure components used across your organization, enabling configuration, compliance, and faster troubleshooting. Automate and deploy. AWS CloudFormation provisions your application resources in a safe, repeatable manner, allowing you to build and to and rebuild your infrastructure and applications without having to perform manual actions or write custom scripts. CloudFormation takes care of determining the right operation to perform when managing your stock or your stack, orchestrating them 
uh, in the most efficient way and rolling back changes automatically if there are errors detected. Codifying, it's just code. Codifying your infrastructure allows you to treat your infrastructure just as code. You can author it with any code editor, check it into a version control system, and review the files with team members before deploying it in production. So let's just have a look at uh, some of the ter terminology used for uh, CloudFormation. We start with a template, which is a basic definition of resources that you create. It's written in JSON or YAML. Then you create and update and delete a stack. A stack is a collection of resources. Stacks are the instanti instantiation of, temp of a template that you've created. Templates can be instantiated multiple times. In other words, you can keep on using um, these uh, these services. And what you end up with is a whole range of resources that are actually being provided and automated through the uh, through the whole process. There are some benefits in doing it this way. You have a benefit of IAC. It gives you the ability to re repeatedly uh, create deployment and use. Its benefit is infrastructure of a code also known as programming infrastructure, is a DevOps practice that we're using today that makes the process of managing your infrastructure easy, reliable, and rapid. Some of the benefits that you actually realize this are the speed and simplicity. IAC allows you to spin up your entire infrastructure by running a script. How simple is that? Configuration, consistency, you can minimize the risk, increase the efficiency in software development, and get cost savings. So think about all of those areas that I was talking about before. When you look at doing automation, this gives you the ability to do that automation. It gives you the ability to make changes to the template very easily to be able to modify the solutions as and when you need them. So CloudFormation can, has also conditions, and conditions allow you to... Um, do a whole lot of uh, things in in terms of building your uh, bu building your stack and infrastructure. The optional condition section, which is in the code that's there, uh, contains statements that define the circumstances under which entities are created or configured. For example, you can create a condition and then associate it with a resource or output so that AWS CloudFormation only creates the resources or output of the condition if it's true. Similarly, you can associate the condition with a property so that AWS CloudFormation only sets the property to a specific value if the condition is true. If the condition is false, AWS CloudFormation sets the property to a different value that you specify. You might use conditions when you want to reuse a template that can create resources in different contexts, such as a test environment versus a production environment. In your template, you can add your environment type input parameter, which accepts either prod or test as inputs. For the production environment, you might include Amazon EC2 instances with certain capabilities. However, for the test environment, you may want to reduce capabilities so, to, so that you can actually save some money. With conditions, you can define which resources are created and how they're configured for each environmental type. Conditions are evaluated based on predefined pseudo-parameters or input parameter values that you specify when you create or update a stack. Within each condition, you can reference another condition, a parameter value, or a mapping. After you define all of the conditions, you can associate them with resources and resource properties in the resource and output section of the template. At stack creation or stack update, AWS CloudFormation evaluates all the conditions in your template before creating any resources. Resources that are associated with true condition are created. Resources that are associated with a false condition are ignored. AWS CloudFormation also re-evaluates these conditions at each stack update before updating any resources. Resources that are still associated with a true condition are updated. Resources that are now associated with a false condition are deleted. So here's an example of, um, of the, uh, I guess, the structure of a, of a template. 
You've got parameters, which are the inputs to the template that I mentioned. You've got mapping, static variables, maybe the uh, latest uh, list of AMIs, resources, the assets that you need to create, the init application. Sometimes you've got applications that may need to run a sysprep or, uh, or some conditions, uh, some scripts as part of um, the infrastructure that gets fired up. You may also, bearing that in mind, need to allow some wait time. And this gives you the ability to be able to ensure that the instance um, doesn't go into full uh, full operation until it's had the chance to load the software or run the uh, scripts at startup. And then there are output values of custom resources created by templates, URLs, and, and usernames. If we look at CloudFormation template, and this is just an example of part one, here you'll see that what we've got is an example of where we've got a T2 Nano. And the T2 Nano is an AMI, Amazon Linux AMI, um, that has actually been fired up. It's a very small, um, you know, a Linux uh, instance. We may want to actually turn around and create this with a T2 Small. We get the option to be, to be able to update the instance type from a T2 Nano to a T T2 Small. And one of the options you have with, uh, with the CloudFormation templates is the ability to have drop-downs so that you can actually select a certain list of uh, instances that you may wish to um, wish to have available as part of the um, uh, of the CloudFormation uh, template processing. CloudFormation is also available in a multi-region environment. So here we've got an example where we have US East One in Virginia, um, AP Southeast One in Singapore, and AP Southeast Two in Sydney. This is an example of where we might have three different types of AMIs that are actually being used in a multi-regional format. So it gives you the ability to be able to drive uh, drive this. And the last example that I wanted to show before um, I let uh, Zoran actually I'll go and show you uh, in more detail how it all works, is you can add parameters based on the inputs. In this example, the parameters will be named um, at the name of service uh, in use or a, a key pair for that particular um, area. So that's just a, a quick snapshot of examples in how you would look to run um, the, uh, the CloudFormation templates. So... What I'd like to do now is basically hand over to, uh, to Zoran, who will actually take you through the next part of um, uh, our presentation. Thank you, Andrew. My name is Zoran Teleski. I am the Technical Program Manager for AWS Educate in Australia and New Zealand. So you might be thinking, you know, what does AWS Educate have to do with automation tools such as CloudFormation and Elastic Beanstalk. Um, as our customers build and innovate with cloud technology, they tell us that one reason they're not moving as fast as they want to um, is due to the lack of cloud-skilled employees and talent. With the increasing demand for cloud-skilled employees, AWS Educate provides an academic gateway for the next generation of IT cloud professionals. With over a million users, AWS Educate is Amazon's global initiative to provide students and educators with the resources needed to greatly accelerate cloud-related learning and help power the entrepreneurs, workforce, and researchers of tomorrow. AWS Educate provides four pillars of resources at no cost to currently enrolled students, educators, and educational institutions. These pillars include AWS credits for free access to AWS technology, content provided by AWS and by top educators around the globe to help educators build new courses or inject into existing ones, training materials to help educators and students build competency on AWS, and collaboration tools to share best practices and connect the community. AWS Educate also provides students with access to a job board populated by many of our customers, our partners, and companies interested in hiring candidates with cloud skills. Whilst AWS Educate content and resources are aimed at building cloud skills that may lead to an AWS certification, AWS Educate is not tailored to get you certified. 
If you're interested in getting an AWS certification, please visit our training and certifications website for more details. So students receive a number of benefits as being members of the AWS Educate program. For one, students don't need to have a credit card to sign up. They get access to 12 different career pathways, which helps them understand um, what are some of the most in-demand jobs around cloud skills. So these career pathways have been developed uh, with the future skills and the current skills in mind of the types of skills that students need to have um, to be successful in obtaining a, a cloud career. Um, students also get access to micro-credentials. These are technology-based credentials um, that give students access to AWS technology learning pathways. Uh, some of these include uh, things like Deep Lens, um, Deep Racer, uh, Startups Badge. Um, these badges are about 10 to 15 hours of learning. Um, whereas the career pathways range from about 25 to 50 hours of learning per pathway. Um, students get access to the AWS technology um, and the management console uh, through a AWS starter account. Students who are of a member university get or school get access to $100 of credits um, each year. Uh, plus additional credits can be allocated to students in a classroom's environment. And then students also get access to the AWS Educate job board, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Educator member benefits include professional learning. So part of this, um, educators gain access to the 12 career learning pathways available to students, uh, and also the micro-credentials um, that are available to students. In addition, um, educators gain access to learning content created by other educators across the globe. Um, giving you the opportunity to uh, build new content or use existing content um, in your new or existing courses. Uh, educators are issued with AWS credits um, and educators get up to $200 of credits per year um, to give them access to the AWS technology um, to be able to build uh, in the cloud. Um, educators also have access to the AWS Educate Classrooms. Now, this is a feature that's been quite popular, um, particularly around the COVID-19 um, challenges that you know a lot of institutions have faced, where they're looking at moving away from their on-premise infrastructure and utilizing cloud infrastructure to you know, give students the capacity to build um, and access technology uh, remotely. So with classrooms, educators are able to create environments for their students where they can add additional credits um, to the student's account um, that are only utilized within that educator's um, classroom environment. So an educator can have multiple classrooms um, and a student can be a member of multiple classrooms. In today's webinar, we're going to go through um, the look and feel of the AWS Educate student portal. Um, and also we're going to look into um, running a cloud formation stack um, and also a Elastic Beanstalk um, automation. So first of all, um, for those of you who have not joined uh, AWS Educate, um, to sign up, go to www.awseducate.com and click on the uh, join AWS Educate button. That will ask you for some uh, details. So as a student, click on the student tab um, and proceed to complete the different um, fields that are, that are required. So you need to enter your, your school name um, and first name, surname, and a few other details. It is important for you to use your um, education or institution um, email address as this is a way that we verify that you are a, a current student um, and enrolled in a school. So um, we'll go back and I will sign in uh, to the program. Let's click through, sign in as a student. Now, when we sign in as a student, uh, the first thing you will see is um, 
some of the coursework that you're completing. Uh, and we'll go through some of these tabs as well. Um, you will be able to see some of the key um, topics that might be on display, um, suggested jobs um, that are available to you for you to apply. Um, you can have a look at your portfolio. Um, if you're interested in applying for jobs, I, I will recommend to keep your portfolio up to date. Um, and your portfolio can be uh, made public so that it is shareable with um, recruiters. Now, when we look at career pathways, uh, I do want to bring your attention to uh, Cloud Computing 101. So Cloud Computing 101 is a starting point. Um, it holds about 25 hours of learning um, with quizzes um, and knowledge checks um, throughout that learning process. Um, it teaches you all about uh, what is cloud and how do businesses such as Netflix and Snapchat gain value from um, the use of cloud technology. So um, that's one to get started on. And then if you wanted to go deeper into um, automation um, using um, tools like cloud uh, formation, then I, I would look into um, perhaps um, studying and completing the DevOps engineer um, career pathway and the solutions architecture um, career pathway as well. So that's for the career pathways. Now, uh, we do have access to badges as well. So through here, you'll, you'll get access to um, the micro-credentials. Um, and uh, then we have your um, AWS account. So this is where you gain access to the AWS um, console and the management console. So by clicking on the starter account, uh, that's going to take me to a web page, um, which is a Vocarium um, lab environment. And there's a bit of a QA and a um, FAQ um, section here. So you'll be able to see um, if you've got questions around you know, what services you can and can't run, um, please look through this. Uh, but for the time being, we are going to run the AWS console. So notice that I've got $15 of credits remaining um, within my account. Uh, typically, as a student of a member institution, you will have um, $100 um, within, your account, within your account every year. Okay, so if I look at um, my EC2 environment, for example, um, let's see what services are running there, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Currently, I don't have anything running and I've got some security groups established. Excellent. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to run up a Python environment um, using Elastic Beanstalk. So Python is a very popular language um, that's been used by a lot of developers um, currently. And Elastic Beanstalk, um, as, you know, as we previously mentioned, is a way to quickly build up an environment without having to maintain um, and set up your servers and um, your operating system environment. Um, it's all created in the back end. So if we want to create an application, we'll, we'll click on create application. Um, and we'll, we'll call this application Zorin's application. Um, we're going to add some, actually we're not going to add a tag. Um, so this is where we configure the um, platform that we run, want to run this environment in. Um, and for the purpose of this webinar, um, we will be choosing Python. Um, so we choose a pre-configured environment, um, and that will be Python. Um, notice that you do have the choice of um, Java, Node.js, Ruby, PHP, Tomcat, um, you do have .NET as well, um, and a range of others too. So it really depends on um, the environment that you want to build. So we're going to have a sample application built with this, and then we can add to that application. So once I hit um, create application, that will go through and start to um, deploy the environment. So in the back end, um, what that's doing is it's creating a um, S3 storage bucket 
but also it will create for me a Linux um, operating system um, EC2 instance um, to be able to run the compute to present that application for me. So we'll let that run through. Um, so this will take a couple of minutes um, and whilst that's happening um, I do want to go back um, into our EC2 environment and you will notice there that uh, an instance will be created um, in that space. So at the moment we don't have any running instances. Um, let's just have a look at this. But uh, we have a Cloud9 environment that was running there previously. Um, but in a moment we should see a new instance appear. So here I can see that the EC2 instance has been created um, and it's a T2 micro, so one gigabyte of RAM, one CPU. Um, this instance being given a private IP address and a public IP address as well. Um, it also has been allocated to a VPC, so there is uh, networking rules uh, that have been pre-configured uh, for this instance. Um, now typically if I uh, was having to create this manually um, without using um, something like um, CloudFormation or um, Elastic Beanstalk, I would have to go in and launch the instance and then from there I would have to select the operating system. Um, I would also have to go in and um, configure the uh, Python runtime as well. Um, so as you could see, uh, all of that has been pre-configured for me um, by using Elastic Beanstalk. So, so if we go into our simple storage um, S3, now I should also be able to see that uh, a storage bucket has been created, uh, which will um, host some of the files um, that are related to my application. And we can see that there is an Elastic Beanstalk um, bucket that's been created and there's some resources um, and other files in there, including sort of the runtime environment. Okay, so I'm um, just going back to Elastic Beanstalk. Um, we'll just see what the application looks like. So from here, um, we can see the name of the application, um, the environment name, and a, a public um, URL, so that's a DNS record that's um, going to give me access to um, that application as well. I can see the platform that we're using um, and the type of um, tier that we've created. So over here, if I click on this, that will take me to uh, my application. Here we go. Excellent. All right, so just to summarize that, um, so as you can see, uh, by using Elastic Beanstalk, I've been able to create an environment where now I can run my Python code. Um, the Elastic Beanstalk has essentially created for me a Linux machine that hosts my application. Um, it's created for me an S3 bucket as well um, to host some of the files uh, associated with that. Um, it's created some uh, networking rules for me for uh, these servers to be interconnected through a VPC. Um, and um, it's installed the runtime environment that which will allow me to run my application um, and my code, uh, my Python code. Okay, so from here, um, we can click into the environment and this will give us an idea around sort of the recent events um, that have happened um, with this application but also it allows us to upload and deploy new code um, to the application and be able to save and load different configurations. So for example, this configuration now, uh, which is running um, this web page, um, I want to save that. So I'm going to save this configuration and I will call that uh, version one. And I will add a description. So this is my V1 of my Python app. 
now I will save that configuration and if I update my code um, and want to load new code um, I will be able to see the different versions of that application so my application here um, let's go back um, I can upload a new code and that will then um, deploy the code to the application but also give me the opportunity to revert back um, to a previous state. So Elastic Beanstalk allows you to quickly deploy uh, manage applications um, without having to learn about the infrastructure that runs those applications. So by using Beanstalk, um, you're essentially deploying the hardware and the infrastructure, um, allowing you to quickly um, test and deploy apps. Um, in different languages. So currently, um, Elastic Beanstalk works with Go, Java, .NET, Node.js, uh, PHP, um, Python, which we've just seen, um, and Ruby. Now, one important um, aspect of this as well is as, as a student, you do have limited credits. Um, so once you've finished using your application, um, it's important that you terminate applications, that way you stop utilizing um, your credits. Now, terminating this application will actually um, shut down all of the resources that have been allocated um, and linked um, to this application. If we go back into applications, uh, let's go ahead and terminate this application. So from here, we're going to tick uh, Zorin's application and we're going to um, delete my application because I have no need for that application anymore. So I will type in the name and oh, I must have got that wrong. Um, let's try that again. There we go. Hit delete and that will start to decommission uh, my application there. So after a quick refresh I can see that the application has disappeared um, and if I go back into my EC2 I will be able to see that there will be no running instances um, running that application. So instances that's it no running instances so I'm not consuming any credits now another um, area that I just wanted to quickly touch on um, was uh, cloud formation so I know we, we had a brief look at this earlier um, so cloud formation uh, allows you to automate a lot of um, the processes and the building around AWS um, we do have pre-configured stacks um, available and a stack is a set of rules um, that will deploy an environment. So let's go ahead and um, just create a stack. So we'll have a look at some of the templates um, that are available to us. And over here, we've got um, a few popular ones. So there's some simple um, stacks. One is a WordPress blog or there is a multi-availability zone um, WordPress blog. So depending on um, whether you want uh, a blog across multiple availability zones or just a single one. And then another one that we the, that we have here is Windows Active Directory. So you can deploy roles um, within a Windows server as well. So if you click on this one here and go to View in Designer, you will be able to see um, the different rules that have been created to deploy um, this stack. So by deploying this, you will have a Windows server deployed, which will set up a domain controller role, um, and that would include Active Directory uh, being set up within that instance here. Um, and then we can see the, um, the JSON file that's associated with that. Um, and some of the options that you will be given when you're deploying this. Um, and you know, one of the benefits around um, doing this type of work is that you can deploy multiple machines um, to you know, hundreds, if not thousands of machines uh, within a single click. So thank you for your time. Uh, I will be handing over back to Shang 
I believe we have some time for uh, Q&A. Thank you, Shane. Thank you very much, Zorin. Thank you for the presentation. Um, now we are opening for question and answers. Uh, throughout the session, I think uh, most of you had uh, realized that we are we have been continuously answering and addressing questions raised raised by the audience. Um, right now, let me start with addressing what some of the most common questions um, asked from the audience. So a lot of you ask about um, micro credentials, the career pathways. What are the use of uh, these these digital badges? Um, how can you use them on resumes or applying for jobs? Um, Zoran had explained to you quite quite a lot on um, the usage of um, these um, these uh, badges, but let me just uh, share with you real quick again. Once you log into AWS Educate, there are twelve learning pathways that you can select. We also call them career pathways. These are named after the most demanded jobs in the industry right now. Um, so for example, for people who are interested in big data, there, there are data integration specialists, data scientists available. And if you want to know more about what does it mean to become a data scientist, just simply click on it. It will give you a definition of what data scientist is in, in the modern society. So read about, read about these paragraphs. And you can also see what are the skills are, that are needed to succeed as a data scientist. How long does this learning pathway or career pathway um, take to complete? And how does that prepare you for the future? And we've have, we have uh, short videos um, introducing each of the career pathways in a more um, dynamic way. So a similar idea. You can look at all the 11 career pathways plus Cloud Computing 101 to get a better idea of what the industry is looking for these days. After you complete each one of the learning pathways or the badges, you will be able to see all of the records on your portfolio page. So for instance, this is my portfolio, right? These are all the badges I have started or completed. And you can see here are the digital credentials. Some of the students ask, OK, so what are the use of the digital credentials, um, digital badges? You can, these are already built in in your digital portfolio. And your digital portfolio could be found and downloaded here. Click download. All of the records that you had started and finished will be showing in that digital portfolio. See, it's popping up as a zip file. So then you can download that zip file and send it in in your job application. Now, for job application, simply click on jobs to search for the most recent posted jobs around the world that are posted by AWS as well as all the companies who are using AWS services, okay? You can search by roles as well as countries. So let's say India. These are currently all the active jobs by AWS as well as AWS customers, meaning companies who use AWS, who are currently looking for cloud talents and there are different pages, okay? You can also select whether you're looking for internship or um, full-time jobs, so on and so forth. You can also match the career pathways that you had completed on this page with the jobs that are, you are interested in, okay? Other questions are centered around, okay, so after this, do I get certified? Let me just quickly explain that the certification you will get after participating in this webinar will be something like this. This is a certificate to congratulate you of completing this current webinar that we're offering right now. This certificate 
is very different from AWS industry level professional associate foundational certification. Okay, so the certifications offered by AWS, these are by different levels of expertise focusing on different topics. And these are industry level certification. The certificate you will get today is a certificate simply congratulating you of completing today's webinar session. Okay, all right, so I'll move the um, floor back to Andrew to address the next question. Thanks, Shang. Um, I did have one interesting question. Um, there was a person that came back and said, can I build AWS environments um, you know, with CloudFormation? Obviously, you've seen the, the demo of that, but what happens if I need to add um, you know, extra uh, images? Uh, you can actually turn around and create uh, multiple uh, environments and add to your environment by building additional CloudFormation templates to build the infrastructure extra that you, uh, that you needed. So, that's a, that's a good question. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Zoran here. I did have a couple of questions as well. Um, the first one was, can I run production apps in my student account? Now, your student accounts are designed to help you learn and apply your skills um, by using the AWS technology. Um, whilst you can run um, production production type apps in your environment. Uh, we don't recommend that you run these for a long time um, because your credits will um, run out if you are running these apps um, for a prolonged period of time. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can set up a AWS um, commercial account if you're looking at running production level um, applications. Um, and the other question that I had was around, are there any limitations when I'm using a student AWS account, which what we call is a starter account. So unfortunately, whilst we, we want to try and give you the most ex authentic experience we can with um, all of our 175 plus services, um, there are some limitations around the starter account. Um, I'll, I'll just touch on a couple um, and then I'll share a link with you all um, around where you can find more information about this. So students can create only one auto scaling app per account or per classroom. So that's one of the limitations. And also just make sure that when you are running services, um, services will only run in US East um, in our Virginia um, centers. So in, in Virginia region. So um, just bear that in mind. There are some limitations around what type of instances you can run. Um, but I will share, send through the FAQ um, on starter accounts. Back to you, Shane. Thank you, Zoran. Um, some other questions um, are centered around, you know, uh, how long can you have the AWS Educate access and um, in terms of credits. So for AWS Educate, um, it is free and provided at no cost to all students and educators for as long as the students and educators are still active, actively registered or affiliated with particular institutions. So you could be registered or enrolled in multiple institutions, that doesn't matter, but for as long as you are a student. The credits are offered on an annual basis. So for instance, somebody named John registered today, April 7th, 2020. His credits will be automatically renewed by April 7th, 2021. So all the credits that you currently have are annually renewable, okay? Um, other questions are related, are there step-by-step -step instructions on AWS Educate to teach you how to use cloud? Like I explained before, go through the learning pathways, you will find module by module, how AWS Educate can guide you to use AWS um, core services. You can also access labs through your AWS starter or regular accounts to go to the console environment. I would highly, highly recommend students go through each one of the learning pathways or career pathways that you're interested and look through the modules 
there will be modules with learning materials, videos or files, uh, documents. There are also knowledge checks, meaning questions to help you assess whether you had understood um, certain topics well enough. So it's a very well designed um, structure and logic for you to go through online learning to gain more skills on cloud computing. For students who have run out of credits, let me share my screen real quick. So for students running out of credits, your educator, so either um, the professor who teaches that class um, or any instructor that um, you, know, you are in contact with, they will have educator ac uh, account. So what I'm showing right now is the educators portal. And through that portal, your teacher, your instructor, your professor will be able to request more credits for his or her class. So those credits will be disseminated back to you. Students do not have individual access to request for additional credits, but educators can. Okay, thank you for the questions. Let me turn back to Andrew and Zoran to answer one question, one more question each, and we will be closing up after they um, answer those questions. Back to you, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Shang. And uh, I just had one one final question: <clears throat> Where can I get uh, CloudFormation templates? And uh, you saw when uh, when Zoran was actually doing the uh, uh, the environment and firing up uh, CloudFormation, there were uh, cloud formation templates available there but of course um, there are a whole raft of uh, cloud formation templates that are um, that are in some of the documentation that we have if you go to uh, uh, aws.amazon.com forward slash architecture you will find uh, a number of white papers on on builds they often include um, cloud formation template um, links uh, in there and of course there are a range of um, uh, of online uh, services that actually provide um, even in GitHub, um, you know, some, some example CloudFormation templates that have been uh, been created. So, thanks, team. Zoran, over to you. Um, so, just to add to that, I think you know, students, um, from my experience, have been quite interested around um, building and testing applications. Um, and Elastic Beanstalk has been sort of a focus area for students in that space because it easily allows them to test code. So do check out um, GitHub. There, there are plenty of samples there um, for students to use. Um, and also, I would encourage students to visit our projects um, website as well. So if you look up AWS projects, um, you'll find some sample tutorial guides um, in addition to the AWS Educate um, tutorials that we have. So thank you for that. And over back to you, Shane. Thank you, Zoran. So um, in the interest of time, we will be closing up this webinar soon. Um, once you exit the webinar, please do spend some time answering the survey questions that we had prepared for you. Um, these are questions that we are interested to, to know. What kind of topics that you'd like to um, at, hear from us in the future? Um, on the screen, you can also see for questions that we're unable to address today please do look for additional resources you know get involved in social media channels get involved with aws user group there are quite a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about technology about aws core services um, you can you can find most of the answers through these groups so do follow these um, additional resources and get involved um, so thank you again for joining before you exit um, please make sure that you have answered uh, the survey questions that we had prepared for you. We want to know what topics that you'd like, to present, like us to present in the future. It is important for us to offer the most demanded topics for you. So thank you again and see you very soon.